On the 1st of February 1995, a 27-year-old man was scheduled to take a flight from London to the United States of America with his friend. He never took this flight, and in the next two weeks he went on an erratic, confusing journey that has left many people bewildered. He was spotted in various different locations across the United Kingdom and had taken out a large sum of money before he went to these areas. Eventually, these sightings stopped and while most people presumed the worst, there were many other theories that suggested he had staged this disappearance to escape to a new life. Regardless of what happened, no concrete evidence of his whereabouts has ever come to light, and to this day, it remains a mystery. This man was Richie Edwards, the lyricist and rhythm guitarist for the Welsh rock band Manic Street Preachers. Considered to be a troubled man but also an incredible songwriter who wrote lyrics that were dark, thought-provoking, and introspective. This is the way he was also described. And it's his intellect that has led people to believe that there may be more to this case than meets the eye. Today, we're going to have a look at the history of Manic Street Preachers and Richie Edwards and try to analyze the question that has baffled many people. Is Richie Edwards the least spoken about member of the 27 Club, or is he a 55-year-old man who successfully staged his disappearance and escaped a world he resented? Manic Street Preachers were formed in Blackwood, Wales in the mid-1980s. A small town with a small population, Blackwood wasn't considered to be any kind of a creative hub, especially back then. Still, four teenagers, James Dean Bradfield, Nicky Wire, Sean Moore, and Miles Woodward, otherwise known as Flicker, took it upon themselves to start a band that they originally called Betty Blue. They were heavily inspired by the likes of Guns N' Roses, Aerosmith, and The Clash, and you could definitely hear these influences in their early work. By early 1988, Flicker had left the band, allegedly because he believed that the group were losing their original punk sound and transitioning to more alternative rock. It was also around this time that the band had changed their name from Betty Blue to what we now know them as. The group were now a trio, but this did not last long. After they released their first single, they began to do a number of shows around Wales, and this is where Richie Edwards comes into play. Edwards had attended the same school as the rest of the band, and he would not only drive them to and from these shows, but he would also help them with their design. He actually photographed and edited the cover for their first single, and in the summer of 1988, he officially joined the band as a lyricist and a rhythm guitarist. Although he wasn't very musically inclined, to the point that he actually mimed playing the guitar at their gigs, he was a very talented songwriter and this almost came naturally. Richie was studying political history at Swansea University at the time, a course that he would eventually graduate from, and he was also infatuated with literature. He was known to have read the works of countless writers, poets, and philosophers, and he would often reference the authors he read in the interviews he gave and the songs that he wrote. The nuance and complexity he had to analyze the world bled into the music of Manic Street Preachers, and when you combine that with the passionate drum solos that Sean Moore provided, the intense vocals and guitar riffs that James Bradfield created, and the bass lines and additional songwriting that Nicky Wire made, the band were a force to be reckoned with, and it was for this reason that they were signed in 1990 by Damaged Goods Records. Ian Bollard from the label had seen them perform a show in the Horse and Groom pub in London in September of 1989, and this is where he decided to sign the band to a one EP deal. This four-track project called New Art Riot was created at Workshop Studios and it was the beginning of a process that lasted for years. The idea was that Nicky Wire and Richie Edwards would write the songs first and then James Dean Bradfield and Sean Moore would compose the music. This is how they created all of their music together and it proved to be an effective way to make their projects. This particular EP did a great job in showcasing Wire and Edwards' ability to convey political messages through their music. The title track is a great example of this. Hospital closure kills more than car bombs ever will, but it saves money because people are expendable. You cold shoulder insurgents yet love arms dealers. Everybody's taking drugs as it makes governing easier. It was obvious from this EP that Manic Street Preachers were not afraid to be political or anti-establishment, and through the composition of Bradfield and Moore, they were able to articulate these messages in a way that was catchy and infectious. 
After the release of their EP, the band signed to an indie label in 1991 called Heavenly Recordings, and at this stage they were also being managed by Philip Hall, a pivotal figure in the history of the band. Hall was a big believer in their work and he fostered the band and their music, to the point that the group actually lived with him for a short time in the early 90s. While they were with Heavenly Recordings, they released two singles, Motown Junk and You Love Us. With the release of these singles and their EP, the band now had enough material to go on a full tour across the United Kingdom, and it was on this very tour that Manic Street Preachers and Richie Edwards specifically gave one of the most talked about and most disturbing interviews of the 1990s. Manic Street Preachers were starting to gain an infamous reputation for various different reasons. Partially because of their erratic live shows, partially because of their combative music, but mainly because they were actually very critical of other bands and rock music in general. They weren't just anti-establishment when it came to politics, they were also anti-establishment when it came to their genre. This led other bands and various different music journalists to grow a slight disdain for the group. They questioned their authenticity and occasionally accused the band of being attention seekers. One of the publications who talked about the band quite a bit was NME, specifically Steve Lamack, who had been critical of the band in the past. He wrote about this later in The Guardian and said the following, We'd started to fall out in public. They had a dig at some bands I liked, I had a dig back, making some rather unkind comments about them in a review of another band called Bleach. It was all a bit petty, but I guess it must have been serious stuff at the time. Serious was a fair way to describe the problems that they had. And on the 15th of May 1991, it reached a boiling point when Steve Lamack was sent by NME to review a live show that the band were doing in Narch. The show was quite tame and apparently under-attended and due to their limited material, they only performed for around 30 minutes before leaving the stage. Apparently, when they did get off stage, a couple of fans yelled plastic punks in their direction, a criticism I'm sure they were sick of hearing. After this, the group, specifically Richie, started to converse with Steve Lamack, and again, this was apparently quite civil and polite. The basis of the conversation was that Lamack didn't necessarily believe the band's image and thought that they were inauthentic. Throughout the conversation, he consistently told Richie, I just don't don't think you guys are for real. Edwards contested this but couldn't seem to convince Lamack of their authenticity. After their conversation, Richie took him aside for a few minutes because he wanted to show him something. It's difficult to explain what happened next in a delicate fashion, but I will try my best. Essentially, Richie inscribed the words for real onto his arm with a razor blade. This process took a few minutes and in that time Steve Lamack simply looked at Richie in complete shock. Eventually an ambulance was called and Richie was taken to the hospital, but not before multiple photos were taken of the incident. He was given 18 stitches and Steve Lamack went back to the enemy offices with an insane story and a decision to make. It was obvious that Richie Edwards was trying to make some kind of a statement with this morbid act. The question that loomed now was should enemy actually release these photos? They were obviously very graphic and intense and it could be deemed irresponsible to release them. Well, none of that was really taken into consideration because 10 days after this incident, NME released their latest edition and on the top of the front page they showed Richie's arm in bandages with text next to it that read, They mean it man. Instead of doing a small write-up on the band, they now did a full page on the incident with pictures showing the entire thing. Later on, it was revealed that audio from the enemy offices was leaked, where staff members were talking about the incident, and although some people protested releasing these pictures, the staff seemed generally okay with it, although they were quite insulting towards Richie Edwards in the process. And it's an appalling picture, and everybody's running around getting upset and appalled and excited. What are you going to do next? I hope it will. Maybe they'll all cut each other's heads off, and that'll be an end to it. Gosh, you've got to print that. It's rock and roll, isn't it? This is self-mutilation, though, James. I think it's an excellent photograph. Good one, Ed. Some, I mean, uh, Sid Vicious I mean, only took it from took it from Iggy Pop. I'm not going to spend all day arguing about these pictures, but you're not trying to make a differential between Iggy Pop and him. It's well, artistic uh, expression, isn't it? Well, don't kid yourself. I'm not kidding myself. It's the expression. Do me a favour. Question is, can we print this picture? Because it is really horrible. 
In this recording, we can hear them talking about this incident in a sensationalist manner, and at no point do they talk about why he really did this. They don't speak about any mental struggles he may be dealing with. They call him an idiot and find any so-called artistry he has to be laughable, and generally, they seem to treat him more like an entertaining jester than a human being. Now, to be fair, this was the early 90s. The discourse around mental health was nothing like it is today. Music journalism was an entirely different world, and Richie Edwards himself was obviously trying to grab some eyes with this act. However, on the other side of the coin, he was a young man in his early 20s desperately trying to authenticate himself to a journalist who didn't take him seriously. The staff of the magazine covering the story didn't respect the gravity of the situation at all, and if you really want to know how NME feel about their journalistic endeavors that week, you can just look to their website where they have 56 pages of stories on the band and very little mention of this incident. In fact, it's very difficult to even find the original transcript of the story, and it seems like something that the publication would like to forget, but in 1991, right after it happened, it was the exact opposite. This story was everywhere, and it was borderline nationwide news. Manic Street Preachers were becoming more and more popular because of their antics and their controversial remarks, and the media were eating it up. To top it off, their music at the time was lauded by their fans, even if it was occasionally snubbed by the critics. The culmination of their independent infamy led them to being signed by Columbia Records at the tail end of 1991, and immediately they got to work on their first album, an album that would launch them into mainstream success and change everything. The band released their debut studio album, Generational Terrorist, on the 10th of February 1992. The album debuted at number 13 on the official UK charts and was met with favourable reviews from critics. The project contained 70 minutes of political rants and personal struggle, with criticisms aimed at global capitalism, overseas banks, third world exploitation and more. It was a lot to digest, but it resonated with the group's fans and created more supporters in the process. This newfound success meant that the band were now able to perform all across the UK and various different parts of Europe, and this is something they definitely availed of. According to Setlist FM, a website that tracks the performances of different bands, 1992 was the busiest year in the band's history, and this came with interviews, meetings, obligations, and more. It's the classic tale of a rock band from a small town finally reaching the success they desired so much, and then realizing it's not all it's chalked up to be. It didn't stop the band from releasing two more albums in quick succession, with Gold Against the Soul in 1993 and The Holy Bible in 1994, which is widely considered to be one of their greatest albums. The Holy Bible was just as politically charged as their typical records, but this time it was more focused, the compositions were stronger, and the lyrics were sharper and more poignant than ever before. James Bradfield said that each song was composed like an essay, and you can see this throughout the album. There were also moments of heavy introspection from Richie Edwards. We can hear this in the song Four Stone Seven Pounds, which is a harrowing song that details the mental and physical anguish that comes with anorexia, a condition that Richie himself was dealing with at the time. Although Edwards said that this song was about a pensioner in their last days, the band, the critics and the fans could read between the lyrics and see that he was crying out for some kind of help. Cheeks sunken and despaired, so gorgeous sunk to six stone, lose my only remaining home, see my third rib appear, a week later all my flesh disappears, stretch it taut, cling film on bone, I'm getting better. These lyrics are obviously intense, but they only really scratch the surface of what Richie was actually going through. During the recording of this album, he was drinking more and more, he was going through intense depressive episodes, and he was in and out of hospital. He even designed the album cover while he was hospitalized. It should also be noted that the band's manager, the previously mentioned Philip Hall, had passed away at this stage, and this was hitting the band hard, especially Richie. It was a tumultuous time in his life, and we can see how depressed he was in the interviews that he gave around that time. He seldom had anything positive to say, and it was obvious that his mind state was getting darker and darker. I mean, I think the older you get, the more life becomes more miserable. Definitely. I mean, you just, all the people you grew up with die. You know, your parents die, your grandparents die, your dog dies, you know, your energy diminishes, there's less books to read, there's no more groups to discover. You know, you just end up a barren wasteland, just trying to find something new, which never really occurs. 
The people around Richie were beginning to understandably worry that he was going to do something extreme. However, it's important to note that Richie himself has actually spoken about this in an interview where he said, in terms of the S word, that does not enter my mind, and it never has done, in terms of an attempt, because I am stronger than that. I might be a weak person, but I can take pain. His friends also echoed this sentiment and said that Richie may have been depressed, but that was something he had not considered or taken seriously. Of course, when your mind is in such a warped and negative state, any thought can enter at random, including that one. And a year after he gave this interview, a series of events unfolded that made many people believe he had changed his mind. However, there are other people that believe there's more to the story. And so we are back where we began the 1st of February, 1995. The Holy Bible is out, the critics and fans are raving about the album, and Manic Street Preachers are set to embark on a promotional tour throughout the United States. James Bradfield waits at the hotel for Richie, but he never shows up. The time before this and the two weeks that followed are very confusing and hard to explain because of the many different moving parts that take place. However, I will do my best to condense it all into a somewhat comprehensive timeline. December 21st, 1994. The final show that Richie Edwards ever played. The gig ended with Richie smashing his guitar on stage. The rest of the band followed suit and the concert ended in carnage. The group have talked about this since and stated that there was a certain feeling in the air that night, with Nicky Wire saying that the concert felt final. January 15th, 1995. At this stage, Richie has shaved off all of his hair and was acting erratic. He began to take out 200 pounds a day from an ATM, which at the time was the maximum amount you were allowed to take out. It is still unclear where this money is or what he intended to do with it, but it has become a serious red flag in this case that raises a lot of questions. January 23rd. A week later, Richie sits down for his last interview for the magazine Music Life. One of the final statements he ever said on record was, People try saying they're strong, but that's not true. Everyone is weak. January 31st. According to several sources, a day before he went missing, Richie gave a book to one of his friends titled Novel with Cocaine and urged them to read the first chapter, which tells the story of the author staying in a mental asylum before vanishing. This again begged a lot of questions. February 1st. Richie checks out of the hotel at 7am, taking only his keys, his passport, his wallet and some antidepressants. He leaves his suitcase in the hotel room and drives to his flat in Cardiff. In the next few days, Edwards is said to have been spotted in multiple different areas, specifically Newport, a town around 12 miles northeast of Cardiff. Here he was seen in the town, the Newport bus station, and most interestingly, the local passport office. At this stage, he had left his original passport in his flat and that is where it remained after his disappearance. At the bus station, he apparently ran into a fan who also had a mutual friend with Richie. They talked about her and a few other things until Richie went on his way. The fan didn't know that he was reported missing at the time and thought nothing of it, except for the fact that Richie was acting slightly strange. February 7th. A taxi driver picks up a passenger that is now said to be Richie Edwards. This passenger was acting strange for the entire trip, allegedly speaking in a Cockney accent before eventually reverting to his ordinary Welsh one. He also lay down in the backseat of the taxi and asked the driver to take the longest way possible. They drove through the nearby valleys and eventually got to Richie's hometown of Blackwood. After a few misguided stops, the man got out at Severn View service station and paid the £68 fare in cash. If that man was in fact Richie Edwards, then that taxi driver was likely the last person on record to have a full conversation with Richie. February 14th. Richie's vehicle receives a parking ticket in the very same car park of that service station. Three days later, it is declared as abandoned and investigated in the hopes of finding him. The car has clearly been lived in, it has recent photos of Richie's family, and it was obvious from the state that it was in that he was not coming back. Richie has never officially been seen since and the most popular theory is unfortunately the most depressing theory. The Severn Bridge is only a mile away from this service station and this area is somewhat of a hotspot for people taking their own lives. In fact, this exact method of people abandoning their vehicles in this car park and walking to the bridge has happened on numerous occasions. But there are still so many burning questions. Why was he seen in a passport office a week before this happened? Why did he take out so much money 
money before he disappeared, and why did he leave so many things behind that could be seen as clues or signs? These are legitimate questions, and when you start to string everything together, you realize that there might be an alternative picture of what happened that night. So let's take a look of the evidence and try to answer the age-old question. Did Richie Edwards stage his own disappearance? We've already talked about the money, the passport office, and the erratic couple of weeks that he spent around Wales, but there has been a lot of new information regarding this theory, and that is mainly because of one book in particular. This book was called Withdrawn Traces, Searching for the Truth About Richie Manick. It was written by Sarah Roberts and Leon Noakes, and it is the first time a book of this nature has been written with full cooperation from Richie's sister, Rachel Edwards. Not only do they have long conversations with his closest friends and family members, many of whom believe that there is more to this story, but they also get access to a lot of his personal belongings, such as diaries, essays, letters, schoolwork, and more. With all of this newfound information, let's talk about some of their discoveries. Firstly, we'll talk about Richie's obsession with writers and authors who have created stories centered around people who have gone off the grid. As we know, he apparently gave a book to his friend a day before he went missing that told a similar tale, but also, he possessed a wealth of literature that covered this exact same sentiment, and in some cases, even wrote detailed accounts of how these characters did this, where they went, and more. This obsession was not only seen in his literature, but according to the book, it's also apparent in his family, with various different members talking about how they too have thought about doing this. Other members of his family have actually gone off the grid and become recluses, shutting themselves off from their family. It's possible that Richie was in some way inspired by this. He wrote about it in his diaries, his schoolwork, and he had conversations about it with his friends. Finally, we'll talk about the mysterious woman. While Richie was in Whitchurch Hospital, he met a woman from Israel who he talked about frequently. Allegedly, they had some kind of a romantic exchange, and in the weeks before he disappeared, Richie talked about wanting to go to Israel. He has allegedly been spotted in India, the Canary Islands, and in Lanzarote, but the idea that he went to Israel is by far the most popular. So let's try and take these various different clues and paint something that looks like a possible idea. Here it is. Richie Edwards, a successful 27-year-old musician who suffers from depression. Obsessed with the literature of authors who want to live as far away from the world as possible, decides that he too wants to leave and start a new life. He takes out 200 pounds a day for two weeks, which leaves him with 2,800 pounds to execute this plan, the equivalent of around 7,000 pounds today. He may have also had more money elsewhere. He uses this money to get himself a new passport at the Newport office. Either he uses fake identification to get himself a passport in a different name, or he strikes up a deal with somebody to get a fake one. Either way, he now has brand new identification with a different name which is essential for his plan. In order to make it look like he is gone for good, he embarks on a bizarre two-week journey that eventually brings him to this service station. Instead of taking the 20-minute walk to the bridge, he instead takes a 37-minute taxi to Bristol Airport, uses his newfound passport to get him a flight to Israel or one of its surrounding countries, meets up with the mysterious woman he met back in the UK, purchases a house with cash, and lives there till this day. It all sounds so optimistic, and maybe it is a bit too convoluted. Maybe the more popular theory is the right one, but sometimes I think it's okay to let the mind wander. Not everything has to be so cut and dry, and leaving a small bit of the door open can allow for a little bit of light to enter a very dark room. Manic Street Preachers are still active today. They took a break after Richie's disappearance, but ended up releasing an album in 1996 called Everything Must Go. The album featured songs written by Richie, and it was their biggest project at the time. Two years later, they released This Is My Truth, Tell Me Yours, and this was the number one album in the United Kingdom when it was released. Their success was pretty much etched in stone by that stage. Sold out tours, chart-topping albums, and consistent radio play, the band were at the peak of their powers. But without Richie, there was a certain flair missing. The music was still great, but the uniqueness and the attitude that Edwards brought was impossible to replicate. Up until the late 2000s, the band put 25% of everything they made from their music into a bank account in Richie's name. To my knowledge, this is not for Richie's family. This is for Richie himself in case he ever comes back, and hopefully, someday, that bank account will make a withdrawal. 